You know, sometimes you think you've got it. I believe God, and then something else comes in life. And you find out, uh-oh, i got to make that choice, it seems like, again, to believe God. Is He still good? Is He still right? Does He still care about me and love me? And today's message is no different along those lines. If you have your Bibles, open to Genesis chapter number 40. Genesis in the 40th chapter, as we continue our study and the look in the life of Joseph, a man who continually, through his life choices, believed God. I've been preaching through the series, and kind of my internal uh, internal title has been in spite of Joseph chose to believe God to follow God in spite of circumstances in his life Joseph you remember did not come from the best family background Joseph's family was at best dysfunctional some of us some of you have come from dysfunctional families some of you are in a dysfunctional family right now in fact my kids on some days would say mom and dad you're dysfunctional but Joseph's family was dysfunctional, fighting between mom and between dad and between second wife, third wife, and fourth wife. Dysfunction at its finest. Fighting between the siblings, dysfunction. In spite of that, Joseph still followed God. What will cause you to stop following God? For some, it's a misfortune in life. For some, it's a particular sickness or ailment. If God really loved me, then I would not be struggling with this disease, this cancer. For some, it's a financial failing in life. If God really loved me, I've been faithful to God my whole life, but because I'm having this particular financial difficulty, I will no longer be faithful to God. It's just not worth it. There's one person told me, God let me down. God let them down because he did not provide a bill that this person thought that God ought to provide for. You do know that God does not promise to pay all of our bills. They say, oh pastor, what are you saying? Well, I could go out tomorrow and I could buy a brand new Ferrari. Well, I probably can buy a Ferrari. <laughs> I could buy a brand new Chevy. How's that one? And just because I try to serve God does not mean that God will guarantee to pay that bill. I could make decisions in my life, right, and suffer the consequences of my poor decisions. I can do that as well. God does promise to supply all my needs. He promises to supply all my needs. What will cause you to, to stop following God? Stop being faithful to God? This morning I've entitled the message, Forgotten forgotten. If you would look in Genesis chapter number 40 and look if you would in verse number 16. Joseph is in prison. We'll look at some of the attributes while he uh, the actions he had in prison but in verse number 16 Joseph is surrounded by two men right now a chief butler and a chief baker. Both men of high esteem in Pharaoh's hierarchy the chief baker being the one in charge of all the baking, and the chief butler most likely was the cup bearer to the king. Every drink was, was done by his hand, and every sip before the king tasted it, the chief butler would taste. They both had fell out of sorts with Pharaoh. Some say that perhaps he thought that they were trying to take his life, to poison him with donuts and something to drink. Some of you could be easily poisoned by donuts. You wouldn't think twice about that, would you now? I'm going to die, I'll go out happy. Chief Baker, maybe it was a loaf of sourdough bread. That's the case. I'd send him to prison anyway for sourdough bread. Whatever the case may be, the chief butler and the chief baker were now in prison. They're in prison with Joseph and, and Joseph began to interpret their dreams. Look with me in verse number 16. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, that was for the chief Butler, he told, said to Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. The uppermost basket there was of all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. Joseph says, Here's the interpretation you're going to die in three days. That's it. You have to wonder then, what, well, what happens next? 
The butler, he said, is going to go back to the kingdom. The baker's going to die. Look in verse 20. It came to pass. And it came to pass. Remember that little phrase, it came to pass. We get in the sermon. In case I forget, let me just point, put this note in here. In your life, all right, no matter what happens, when God is in control, it will come to pass. All right, it came to pass. Don't miss that little phrase, it came to pass. The third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday. I love birthdays. One of seven kids growing up, my parents did a phenomenal job of, of making sure our birthdays were special. They probably did too good of a job because I still enjoy birthday, birthday months, birthday weeks, birthday years to this day. In fact, I have what some would call unbirthdays. I say, well, pastor, what's an unbirthday? Let me enlighten you to an unbirthday. It's a day in the year that's not your birthday, but it's still your birthday. In fact, one day my wife, who knew this concept, shows up and she's a present wrap. Middle of the summer, my birthday's in, in, in February, February 27th to be exact. Did you write that down? I didn't see anybody write that down. Middle of summer, my wife brought me a present. She goes, well, happy birthday to you. It's your unbirthday today. You gave me a present on my unbirthday. Praise the Lord for a godly, loving, compassionate wife. I love birthdays. It was Pharaoh's birthday. Obviously a big celebration. Bible says that he made a feast unto all of his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and, the chief, and of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. And here in verse 23 is what I want to look at today. We look at our life and what happens to us sometimes. In verse 23, the Bible says, Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. He forgot him. He forgot Joseph. He forgot the one in prison. He forgot the one who helped him. He forgot the one who gave him the interpretation. He forgot the guy who just a little bit ago had asked him to remember him. He forgot all about him. You ever forgot somebody? Being from a big family, I remember the day that we left my sister at church. We've told her to this day it was an accident. And of course it was an accident. I would never try to get rid of, of my siblings. There's no market for them. With three kids, with three kids, I have forgotten one before. You ever been forgotten? I was in college and we were traveling uh, for a big, large brass ensemble. We were going to Williamstown, Virginia. We had a driver, we left at night, the university, we were driving all night long. We stopped at a rest stop with the, the big tour bus, and the main driver, the name was of Craig Olson, got off the bus. He was a jovial man, having to be uh, uh, very kindly to me. I had sat up by him on the bus most of the trip, talking to him, trying to keep him awake so we didn't die on this bus. At the rest area, we jumped off the bus and switched drivers. New driver jumped in the, the front seat, and we took off. That was before cell phones were very prevalent. We arrived eight or maybe six or so hours later in Williamstown, Virginia, and we're waiting a phone message that uh, Mr. Craig Olson had been left at the, tr at the rest area. He was inside and he came out and the bus wasn't. You ever forgot somebody? I read a story about a similar er circumstance happened to a man and his wife. She was in the, the back seat uh, of the car and they stopped at a rest area. I read this story. Uh, Sam was his name and as he jumped out of the restaurant, he, uh, the rest area, he jumped back in the car and his wife was in the back seat so he thought and five hours later he realized she wasn't with him. Now men, how do you get out of that one? A little harder to get out of that than if you forget sweetest day. You ever forgot something before? You can forget a birthday, maybe you forget an anniversary, forget a child. Forgetfulness is not always a pleasant thing. Sometimes later on in life, people will, will have a disease, Alzheimer's or dementia. Forgetfulness. My grandfather walked this path, hard path. Grand, my grandfather was a, was a mentor to me. He was one that I would call for questions. And I remember the day that he didn't remember me. He asked, who is that? And he said, well, that's your grandson, that's JD. It's hard hard. Forgetfulness. 
But I read this account and I can't help but think and challenge us this morning that there are times that we will think that God has forgotten us. We will think, we'll be tempted to feel that God has forgot all about us, has forgot our current status, He's forgot our needs, He's forgot our problems. But my friend, this morning, I don't want you to be discouraged because God has not forgotten you. Let's pray as Lord's help in this time this morning. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, I thank you for these brief moments that we have. Lord, I pray that you would illuminate and enlighten your word. Lord, help me as I speak to say those things that will be true and honest and right according to your word. Lord, I pray that there's someone among us today, Lord, who has perhaps discouraged you, has been tempted to believe or think that you have forgotten them. Lord, their heart would be turned towards you today. They would be reminded of your goodness. Lord, from the life of Joseph, they would be challenged again to live faithfully for you. Lord, we ask for your help and blessing. Lord, I pray there's someone under the sound of my voice this morning, whether in the auditorium or online, who's never trusted you as their Savior, who does not know that if they die today, they'd go to heaven. Lord, I pray that today they'd believe on you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. I want to look at this morning three points about Joseph being forgotten. I want to remind us again, it's been a constant theme, but one that we can be reminded about every single week that I see, first of all, that Joseph was still faithful. Joseph was in prison, but was still faithful. Do not miss the part that Joseph, throughout his life, has been faithful. You're like, Pastor, you've talked about his faithfulness before. You're right, but you know what? There are times you and I are tempted to not be faithful to God. I see a few ways he was faithful. He was faithful, first of all, to a commitment. In verses 3 and 4, chapter 40, if you'd look there, the Bible says, And he, that's Pharaoh, put them, that's the chief butler and baker, in the ward, in the house of the captain of the guard, into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. Joseph was in prison there falsely, falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. The chief butler and chief baker showed up there. They're dropped off at this, at this prison, right where Joseph's at. And look at verse number 4. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he, that's Joseph, served them, and they continued a season in the ward. Joseph had to serve these men, the chief baker and the chief butler. In the Egyptian calendar, a season would typically be uh, four months of 30 days, or 120 days Joseph is serving these men. 120 days, Joseph, who has been there by false accusations, is serving, taking perhaps their breakfast or their lunch or their supper, cleaning up after them, taking care of their needs. Joseph is serving them day in and day out. He is faithful in his commitment. All right, He didn't choose to be in prison. He didn't ask to be in prison. He didn't ask to serve these men, but he was put there by the hand of God. He was put there. And I don't see that Joseph has a stinking rotten attitude, do you? I don't see that. In fact, we'll see throughout this passage the exact opposite. Some of us have tremendous jobs, tremendous livelihoods, and tremendous blessings, and we have a stinking, rotten attitude. Can you believe my boss that I have? I'm getting paid time and a half, but that's not worth it. Can you believe this car? Boy, it's five years old. Wow. We complain instead of being committed. We need servants of the Lord who are committed, committed to the ministry. Now listen, you may not have the best voice, but you can still sing to the glory of God. You may not be the most eloquent speaker, you can still teach to the glory of God, commitment to their master, commitment to the ministry. We need folks with commitment. Now let me pause here real quick. This is not about a guilt trip to make sure you're in church. We are in interesting times right now, are we not? And since day one of COVID, all right, if you don't feel well, you should not be here. But there have been some. There have been some who have no problem going everywhere else in life, but not the church. All right, there have been some who, who you, you see, boy, they'll go here and they'll do this and they'll do that with thousands of people, but heaven help us, let's not go to church. Maybe church isn't the problem. Now listen, if you're not feeling well, you're not here, there, there should be no guilt. Don't feel it from me. I don't want you to. I've said that since day one. 
I call various church members, right? You, many of you know this. I call you, if you, and if you're not here, and almost always the first response is, well, pastor, you know, I'm going to get in back there. Listen, if I call you, it is not to make you come back to church. It's because I care about you. I want to find out how you're doing, all right? But it doesn't change the point that we ought to be committed to Jesus Christ in spite of our circumstances, which sometimes we don't get to choose. Joseph didn't get to choose them. Boy, if he had, he would have chosen a completely different set. And we think in our minds, well, if I had that circumstances, if I had those finances, if I had those particular hours, then I would be committed. Then I would be faithful. I see that Joseph is just committed, serving these men every day for about 120 days without any hope. He doesn't know that that's not his, his livelihood or his obligation the rest of his life, but I see something beyond that where I see Joseph's attitude. I don't only see commitment, I see compassion. Look in verses 6 and 7. And Joseph came into them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. So Joseph comes in and he noticed that their faces are, are down, that they're sad. He notices that something's wrong. And Joseph asks them why they're sad. He was thinking more about them than himself. You see, Joseph wasn't having a pity party like we like to have. What, what is that little song? Nobody likes me, everybody hates me. I think I'll go eat worms. Oh, we're good at that. I'm sure you have it bad, but I've got it worse. I don't see Joseph complaining here. He asks him, verse number 7, he asked Pharaoh, Pharaoh's officers that they were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? Even in the midst of a personal trial, Joseph was concerned about somebody else. I tell you, that's one reason I love this church. We have people who have gone through tremendous trials, but I find a compassion at First Baptist Church, a care and concern for others that just warms my heart. I've had it on a personal level. You have showed me extreme compassion and concern. I've watched it with other people. I've been given testimony from other people. Can you believe I was going through this and so-and-so blessed me this way? So-and-so called me about this. So-and-so said this to me. Boy, that is the way a church ought to be more concerned about someone else than yourself. You may be having a bad day, but probably someone's having it worse. What uh, problems are like fish stories, right? They grow with time. Someone always has a better one. And the more often you tell it, the more people don't like to hear it. They're like fish stories. Joseph, even in the midst of personal conflict, wasn't just concerned about himself. I read this story about Colonel Sanders from Kentucky Fried Chicken. Who doesn't like Kentucky Fried Chicken? You know what, if you don't, well, we'll see at the altar at the end of the service. You still have time to get right. He was on an airplane, and an infant was screaming on the airplane. I've had the privilege of flying a number of times in my life, and I've had airplane rides with a screaming infant before. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, my wife and I, we've had airplane rides where it was our baby crying a little bit. Boy, the agony as a parent that you feel at that moment. You say, Brother Howard, does it cause you to have more compassion on the others? I wish I could see it did. <laughs> but that's why I have noise-canceling headphones now. All right, and you put those on and turn up louder, louder, louder. But he was on an airplane with a screaming infant. The mother and flight attendants flight attendants tried every trick they could think of but to no avail finally the story goes the colonel asked if he could hold the baby and he gently rocked it to sleep later a passenger said to Colonel Sanders we all appreciate what you did for us Colonel Sanders, colonel Sanders replied he goes I didn't do it for you or for me or for us I did it for the baby that's compassion that's compassion. No one would have faulted him for doing it for everyone else on the plane. No one would have faulted him for even for his own sanity and peace of mind to rock the baby to sleep. I could relate to that. But his words, I didn't do it for me or for you. I did it for the little one. That is compassion. When you give to someone else without any opportunity for return. 
There is nothing that baby could do except maybe be quiet for Colonel Sanders. And there will be times in your life when those you will help, those you have compassion upon, can do nothing for you. Nothing for you. That's true compassion. We see it from our Lord Jesus Christ. His compassion when he died on the cross to pay for our sins. There is nothing we can do for him. Yes, we get to praise him and we get to serve him. But he doesn't need us. We need him. We need Him. And we see His compassion. While we were yet sinners, the, Christ, uh, the Bible says Christ died for us. Ultimate compassion. And we ought to emulate that. It ought to be part of our life. Not only at church, but at home. There ought to be compassion between a husband and a wife. I wonder that if I were to come to your house and ask for Diet Coke, how quick you'd grab that Diet Coke versus how quick you'd grab it for your husband or your wife. There ought to be compassion between a parent and a child, between a brother and a sister. I had six of them, six siblings. I understand siblings. I have three children myself, and there are some times they don't act like saints. Sometimes they act like their, I'd say mother, but I'll say father. They act like their father. And even sometimes my kids bicker back and forth about the silliest things. Come on, parents, you know what I'm talking about. What do they bicker about? You name it, they can bicker about it. Whose turn it is to sit up front in the car? <laughs> Thanks, Brother Mark. He said, let's not go there. That happens, though, doesn't it? Compassion. At our house, whose turn is it to let Max, the almost dog, out? And boy, why is this? Right? My kids are in junior church, so I can talk about them for just a second. And like they know anything they say can and will be used against them in church. All right, in a sermon. Why is it they can't remember a blooming thing I say? All right, they can't remember anything about schoolwork and what responsibilities they may have to clean the room or to make it better, any such chores. But you ask them who let the dog out the last 15 days and what time it was, they know that exactly. They said Monday was me at 3, 325 and Tuesday I did it at what? You know, they know... Um, your mind works just fine, doesn't it? <laughs> compassion. Joseph showed compassion to those men. These men then went on to give their heartache. They said, Joseph, we had a dream. We had a dream and we don't understand it. Well, they came to the right man because Joseph has worked through dreams before. Before Joseph was 17, he was having dreams. And Joseph says something in verse number 8 that I love. And he said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. You see, I see Joseph's commitment. I see his compassion. But here, I see Joseph's confidence. Joseph had some confidence. He said, listen, tell me your dream. They belong to God. I, I pray you, tell me what it was. He had a confidence in his God, even though Joseph was not in the place that he chose or the position that he desired. He was not around his family like he thought was promised. Joseph still had a confidence in his God. I'm reminded of 2 Samuel chapter 22, where the Bible says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. In these uncertain times, you can have a confidence in your God. Pastor, I don't know what to, tomorrow will bring. I don't know what today will bring. That's all right. God does. A confidence in His God. He's our rock. He's our fortress. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. During this time of COVID, of uncertainty, and now we come to election time, we look at our world that seems to be in turmoil. You ought to go back to the rock, and His name is God. It's Jehovah. You ought to spend time with the fortress right here in His Word every single day. That's the confidence. And Joseph had a confidence in his God. He also had a confidence in his relationship with God. Notice what he said. He said, tell me your dreams. Tell me. He had a confidence in his relationship with God. He believed that he com com could communicate with God. He believed he could ask of God. And he had a confidence in the answer. Not only did he believe that God could answer him, but that God would answer him. We can have a confidence in our God. We have a confidence in our prayers. When we say that phrase, I believe God, understand 
We're not talking about something made out of wood or stone or something of a drawing. We're talking about a living being, the creator of the universe, the almighty, powerful God who hears and answers prayers. He hears when you pray, when you're driving down the road, when your heart hurts, when you're in need. God hears and he answers. There's answers to prayers, and we have seen them through this time. We could take hours and talk about answers to prayer. I was looking back through my journal this morning about the answers to prayer and looking back what I was praying for and to see God answer. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time. There are some that I'm still praying for. I'm still wanting to see God work. And so just because an answer doesn't come in 13 and a half seconds, or just because it doesn't come when you think it ought to come, doesn't mean that God is not going to answer or that he has not hurt you. Joseph had a confidence in his God. He gives them his interpretations. They say thanks. The butler says, well, thanks. I get to go back to work. Baker says, nope, thanks. And Joseph then gives them a charge in verse 14 and 15. Look with me, if you would. In verse 14, Joseph says, but think on me. But think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me. And make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For, I indeed, for indeed, was I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews... And here also have I done nothing that they should put me in to the dungeon. He made a charge. Joseph was, faith, was faithful, but second of all, this morning where we're going, he was forgotten. We looked at that verse, look in verse 23. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forget him. Look in the first verse of chapter 41, and it came to pass at the end of two full years. Two full years, Joseph was forgotten. Two full years, 730 days in the Egyptian calendar. Two full years, 17,520 hours. Yes, I did the math. 1,052,200 minutes. You want to know the seconds? I've got those too. 63,072,000 seconds. He was forgotten. And don't think for a moment that he didn't feel that forgetfulness. He had helped these men. He was forgotten by those he knew. He'd spent 120 days with them, not just a casual acquaintance. He had been in a similar place with them, with a similar problem. They were there, not of their own accord. And we all get dis discouraged because we think that those we know best won't disappoint us. I wonder if when the butler went out, Joseph thought, this is it. Finally, finally, I'm, I'm getting out of prison. Maybe he thought, this is it. Maybe he'll talk to Pharaoh. Maybe just any day now. Maybe it'll be tomorrow. I'm going to get the call from Pharaoh's office. Maybe he thought, you know what? Th this week, it's coming. I know it's coming. We get discouraged because those we think we know best sometimes disappoint us. He was forgotten by those he knew. Sometimes those around you will forget something. Will let you down. Forgotten by those he had helped. He had helped with their daily needs. The Bible says he served them. He would helped with their dire needs, that interpretation. He had gone out of his way to help these men, and the chief butler still forgot him. Huh. See, if I help anybody ever again, I gave him a good interpretation. I didn't have to do that. I could have let him just go on his merry way. Forgotten by those he'd helped. Forgotten by those he'd spent time with. He was forgotten by those who prospered. The chief butler was restored. He was in a place to help, and he was forgotten. If anyone could have helped Joseph, it would have been the chief butler. He was with Pharaoh all of the time. Maybe you've met people who like to name drop. Oh, well, you know, let me call so-and-so, that's my uncle. I, I saw them once on TV. I'm sure they'll listen to me. 
the chief butler could name drop. He was with Pharaoh, forgotten by those who prospered. And listen, my friend, there are some times that in my life and your life, when things don't turn out exactly like I envisioned in my mind, maybe that doesn't happen to you. But sometimes I got my own plans in my mind. I know just how this will work out and just what, what will happen here and how this will work and this will work and this will be good and this will be good and it all comes crumbling down to the ground. That ever happened to you? Best laid plans? I've got good plans up here. Good plans. They're always successful in my mind. This will be the, the best sermon, the best event. This is going to be great and all of a sudden it's a mess. It's a mess. I know exactly how we can handle this financially and all of a sudden over here the hot water heater breaks. That's not supposed to break. That's supposed to last for another 13 and a half years. Everyone knows that hot water heaters last for 55 years. Everyone knows that. I wasn't planning on that. That's not supposed to happen. I'm not supposed to hit a deer. I'm not supposed to get sick. This is not supposed to happen. And then you pray and it seems as if God has forgotten. We're tempted to think things like, but Lord, I've been faithful to you. We're tempted to think, Lord, but I've even shown compassion on others. We're tempted to think, Lord, I, I, I've tried to serve you. Why have you forgotten about me? Those thoughts come, crowd, come crowding in. Sometimes it's when you lay down at night. You finally stop in the day. You lay down in that bed for whatever reason, those thoughts just come pounding back in. Maybe God just forgot about you. Maybe he doesn't really care about you. My friend, can I tell you something? Those thoughts are not true thoughts. Because I've entitled the message Forgotten, but that's only half the title. The whole title of the message is Forgotten, but not Forsaken. Would you look at verse, at, at chapter 41, forgotten but not forsaken. Because after two years, 24 months, 730 days, 17,520 hours, 1,052 minutes, or 1, 000, 52, 000 minutes, and 63,072,000 seconds, it seemed like a long time, it seemed like an endless time, it seemed like a hopeless time. After two years, the Bible says that Pharaoh dreamed. And in verse number 9, Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Two years later, two full years later, the perfect time came for Joseph's entrance onto the scene. Two full years later, Joseph was ready, and Pharaoh was ready, and the country was ready. It was God's perfect timing. You see, there was a God-sized problem. Pharaoh had a dream. That was a problem that only God could give it, and no one else could answer it. The Bible tells us, I think it's verse number 8, that Pharaoh asked everybody, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? And no one could interpret it. A God-sized problem. Ah, but God had a God-prepared man. His name was Joseph. You found him in prison. And the only reason the chief butler knew about him was because he was also in prison. Chief butler, butler probably would not have met him at Potiphar's house. Definitely would, would not have met him if he'd still been with his family. But because Joseph was in prison, he was in God's place. In God's preparation. And Joseph may have thought he was forgotten, but he was not forsaken. He was never dejected from God's point of view. God had never departed. You see, you may think you have been forgotten, but you're never forsaken. You may feel down, but with God, you're not out. You may feel dejected, but with God, you're not deserted. You may feel lonely, but with God, you have a companion. You may feel forgotten, but with God, you are never forsaken. There was a pastor, a lady from his church, struggling with some of these thoughts. God didn't care. God forgot about me. God has forsaken me. They're in his office, and the lady was holding a baby in her arms. 
the pastor, in a moment of wisdom, probably from the Lord, said to the lady, drop your baby. She looked aghast. Well, sir, no, drop him. Drop the baby right to the floor. Drop the baby. Well, pastor, I would never, ever do that. Ma'am, how much money can I offer you to drop your baby? Sir, there's no amount of money you could ever offer me to drop this baby. And he wisely said, then do you really think you care about your child more than God cares about you? Forgotten, but not forsaken. Do you know how much God loves you? Do you know how much God cares about you? He even knows how many hairs came out of your head this morning when you were doing your hair. Forgotten? You may think that. But my friend, you've not been forsaken. God knows the right path for you to take. Joseph would not have draw, drawn up that plan. Sometimes we'll tease a coach here at BBA. Well, coach, draw us up a good one. You know, they scribble on this board, do this and do this. You run around there. Do they work? Half the time, no. No. Draw us up a good one. But you know what? The Lord always draws up a good one. His plan always works. But sometimes he wants you to be the bottle cap. To run all the way around. Where no one else sees anything. Where you think, why am I running here in left field? Because he's going to bring you back in at the exact right spot. For the home run, Joseph, he was a bottle cap. He was on this whole path that no one could understand, especially not Joseph, except God. He knew the right path. He knoweth the way that I take. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in his way. You know, if someone had said, Joseph, when he was young, Joseph, you're going to be in, in Pharaoh's palace. I want you to get ready to go there. What path would Joseph have taken? Well, I think I'll go to Pharaoh's school. I'll learn how to be a good Pharaoh assistant. I'll apply at the, the palace temp agency. And get a low-level position and work my way up in the palace and, and under Pharaoh. But God said, I got a different path for you. It'll be perfectly prompt on his timing and perfectly prepared. A small boy was flying a kite high in the sky when it drifted into a cloud bank. A pastor buyer said to the young boy, what are you doing seeing just a string? He said, I'm, I'm flying a kite. The pastor buyer said, well, young man, how do you know the kite's still up there? The boy said, well, every once in a while, I feel a tug on the string. How do we know God's still up there? Well, every once in a while, you feel a tug on the string. Last thought is this. God will enable you to face challenges with calmness. When he finally stands before Pharaoh, he's called up into the, into, the, into the palace. Chapter 41, verses 14 through 16. Pharaoh asks, or informs me of a dream. I'm always intrigued by Joseph's response. Joseph doesn't say, well, let me tell you about Potiphar's wife. He didn't go there. Let me tell you about my brothers. Let me just tell you. He says, it is not in me, God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. You see, Joseph was faithful because he's a calmness that came from the all night, Almighty. Can I encourage you, my friend? Be still and know that I am God. I was talking to Brother Cowling this morning. You reminded me of a, of a, of a story, kind of, kind of a history lesson here at First Baptist Church. Forgotten but not forsaken. Brother Scott was here for many years. He taught in our school. Brother Scott is supremely talented but teaching would not be the best talent that he has. Wasn't quite sure why he was here. When I was an intern, Pastor Scott was the youth pastor, or filling in for youth pastor at First Baptist Church. That was not the best scenario for the teenagers or Pastor Scott. Wonderful for me. But in that time, in that time, God brought along a little ministry here at First Baptist Church called Reformers Unanimous. Little ministry that has seen countless families put back together again. Countless men and women touched by the power of Jesus Christ and the gospel. Countless young people touched by the power of Jesus Christ because of Pastor Scott's ministry. He reminded me, he said, you know, there are times I was thinking, like, why am I even here? What does God have for me? 
God had him here for a number of years, I want to say maybe eight or nine years or so, before Reformers Unanimous came to fruition at First Baptist Church. I, as a pastor, could not think of having Reformers Unanimous without Pastor Cowling. Internationally alone, our Reformers right here at First Baptist Church is. They know it around the world. He has trained other Reformers Unanimous around the world, internationally. He's trained it across the country. Because he's somebody, no, because God's somebody. He just remained faithful. Forgotten? Felt that way. Forsaken? Never. My friend, this morning you may think God's forgotten about me. I've been praying. I've been serving. I've been trying, Lord. You forgot about me. You may feel that way. But you're not forsaken. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for your faithfulness to us. Lord, you're such a gracious and compassionate God. Lord, help us. We at times are frail in our flesh. Lord, we're frail with the problems that come, but Lord, we want to trust you. We want to keep our faith in you. Lord, help us to not be discouraged, but to be encouraged. I wonder if you're here this morning with your heads bowed and eyes closed. Say, Pastor, this morning, the Lord touched my heart. Pastor, I could identify with what you're saying. I, I have felt a little bit forgotten by God. This is nothing to be embarrassed by that. I think if we're honest, there's, all of us could say there's times in our life we felt that way. I would say, Pastor, as you spoke this morning, God spoke to me. Would you pray for me this morning? I want to make sure I stay faithful to God. Maybe I feel like I'm forgotten, but I, I want to be faithful. I can't wait to the end of the story. I don't see it right now. Would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up, slip back down. We'll see it. Amen. 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 Who else? I want to stay faithful. Amen. 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 I see the hand. Amen. I wonder if you're here this morning or online and you'd say, Pastor, I've never trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I'm not sure that if I die today, I'd go to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me? I'll call no more attention to you than I did to anyone else. But I'd love to pray for you today. I would say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. I've never trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Would you pray for me this morning? Would you pray for the others? If you slip your hand up, slip back down, we'll see you. I'll call no more attention to you than anyone else who says, that's me, Pastor. Maybe you're with us online. You've never trusted Jesus Christ. If you're here in a moment when we stand, would you come forward? We'll open a Bible and show you. If you're online, would you call us at the church? There's a number that will be on the screen in just a moment. We have someone there by the phones who would love to open the Bible over the phone and share with you the good news, how that God loves you and Jesus Christ died for you. Lord, I pray for this time of invitation. Lord, I pray for those who have indicated by an upraised hand that they want to remain faithful to you. Lord, help them to do that. Lord, and I pray that if there's anyone here or online who's never trusted you as their Savior, that today they would come forward and let us open the Bible. Those at home or somewhere else would call us on the phone, Lord, and allow us to share the gospel over the phone. Lord, may we please you during this time. Bless the invitation in Jesus' name. Amen.